Alright, hey everybody, welcome to the debut episode of the Safe Prep Show. I am Justin, and uh, with us today, a uh, very special guest, Eric. Uh, I met Eric on TikTok. Eric, how are you, brother? I'm doing well, how are you? I am good, sir. So, uh, I'll tell you how I came across you. I used to have a Patreon account where I, I did some prepper education. And I would ask, uh, I would ask those uh, in that group, what they needed help with and uh, a couple of folks in particular that lived in uh, Texas wanted to know how to stay cool uh, when they didn't have a good way to stay cool such as grid down or the AC out and uh, you popped up on my F1, FYP one day and uh, I was like man he's got the answers so uh, I think I left a few comments on, on videos and uh, eventually I just had to tag you in my own video and uh, that's how, how, how we got in touch. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're my first guest. Um, I wanted you to kind of introduce yourself to everybody first. So um, I'll let you do that. And then uh, uh, the next question I wanted to ask you is, I kind of know where you're at right now, but I want to know how your raising or your childhood got you to where you are today. So uh, this is your show, my friend. So let's get in it. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate you having me on. I'm honored. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm working as a Ph.D. student right now. I'm um, getting my degree in Florida. Um, I'm studying medical anthropology, which is um, anthropology through a medical lens. And I'm studying the um, um, I'm studying natural disasters and specifically heat waves. And I'm looking to get a sense of how people all over the world deal with heat, especially um, how they have dealt with heat before, um, really before AC came along. So prior to 1920 and, um, and also for all those millions of people around the world who don't have AC. So, um, um yeah you mentioned um how my childhood affected um my decision to do this and uh yeah i i grew up in the shenandoah valley so rural virginia um, my dad worked as a geographer my mom was a teacher um we didn't have ac until i was 14 because um, neither of my parents had grown up with ac um living out um out in the Shenandoah Valley, I had grew up with a really great appreciation for nature. Um, we had the woods, the fields, the Shenandoah River. Um, and being in a place that rural, there wasn't that much to do except go out in nature. <laughs> um, so, um, and also my dad working as a geographer um, influenced me to think about nature and think about the climate. Um, even more than I would have otherwise. Um, then when I, um, when I graduated from my BA program in 2010, I knew I wanted to go into the Peace Corps because I wanted to get out. I wanted to see more of the world. Um, so I did my first mission in Niger. That was, excuse me, that was cut short by a terrorist incident. So, um, um, so we got evacuated, and so I came back home for six months, reapplied, and they sent me to Madagascar. Eric, so, for those that don't know exactly what the Peace Corps is, what is the Peace Corps? Sure. So the, the Peace Corps is a U.S. government body that um, operates as a, uh, as a wing of U.S. foreign policy. So they recruit volunteers to, um, to go abroad, to live in um underprivileged countries to um help them with technical stuff and some of that stuff can get very technical like um hydrological engineering or um, architecture or it things like that um some of it is very non-technical like just teaching folks about um, basic techniques for health so i was actually on that side i was in health sector so there was a lot of um talking to folks about malaria, talking to folks about proper nutrition, um, a lot of um, 
talking to pregnant mothers about, um, okay, like make sure you're getting enough vitamins because that's going to affect the health of your baby. Um, and when I lived there, I, um, I lived in a house that was um, probably built by a foreigner. Um, Madagascar was colonized by France from 1895 to 1960. So I, I would guess that this house was built by a Frenchman. Um, but there was no electricity, no AC. Um, it had thick walls. It had, had a nice porch um, and it had a concrete floor. So with those things combined, I was never really hot in that house. Um, it would get to like um, probably like 105 outside with, um, I don't want to say 100% humidity, but, but pretty high humidity. Um, and I was always comfortable when I was in that house. And that kind of showed me um, the things that can be done without AC. So you uh, talk a little bit about your education and mm -hmm. where you passed and, and obviously what you're doing now and, and what all that entails. Yeah. So I got my BA in French, which was awesome for my career prospects. Um, but I knew I, but I kind of chose French cause I, I knew I wanted to go into the Peace Corps and uh, French did help me out a little bit in Madagascar. Um, after that, after I came back from Peace Corps, I um, bounced around to a few jobs. I got a really great job in DC that allowed me to save up money. And I, uh, I used that money to go to grad school in Germany. And I, um, I went to the University of Heidelberg in their medical anthropology program because um, it was just a really once in a lifetime opportunity to study that. I, w I knew I was interested in anthropology. And so um, instead of studying uh, general anthropology, I just chose to study medical anthropology. So what is medical anthropology exactly? Yeah. So it's, um, it's looking at anthropology through the lens of medicine. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of anthropologists have, a lot of medical anthropologists have looked at the anthropology of hospitals and just like how hospitals work. And um, there's other things like alternative medicine, because um, we're used to thinking of um, Western medicine or biomedicine as the only legitimate kind of medicine. But there's a whole bunch of other schools of medicine like Ayurveda in India. Well, India has, um, sorry, I should say South Asia has a whole ton of these alternative medicine types. So you've got Ayurveda is the big one, but yoga is also a school of alternate medicine. And then you have um, smaller ones like Siddha or um, it's the one in or um, Unani. Um, and then you have, um, other ones like, um, traditional Chinese medicine or TCM. Um, you have indigenous medicine from, um, from places like Peru. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just a whole world of that stuff out there once you really get to looking at it. So tell me about the, <clears throat> the lessons that you learned during your travels and what you've learned in school. And then uh, segue that into uh, you starting your TikTok and kind of how that mm -hmm. happened and uh, where your content has kind of gone there. Um, uh, because the way that, that you you live and exist uh, after you came back from some of your travels uh, is interesting because you've kind of adapted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... As I've traveled, um, I've realized how um, the way we use AC in the U.S. is kind of the exception toward um, to the the way people view it and use it um, in the world more broadly. Uh, however, um, there is a trend of a lot of countries becoming more like the U.S. in in the way they 
view and use AC. Um, there was a really great study um, that I used for my thesis for my thesis research on uh, Singapore um, and how attitudes are changing there. So, um, so you, so there was kind of this gradual um, realizing that um, there were a variety of attitudes toward AC out there. And then there was also the kind of sharp, um, realization when I got back from Madagascar that, um, oh, AC doesn't really feel good anymore. Like, um, I, I had been living in that house for so long, um, with no AC that when I came back to the U S, um, my, my body had, um, had adapted to those conditions and I, and I, I'm not really sure why I never really adapted back. And so, um, AC always felt too cold to me. And so, um, I wish I could say right now I live without it. Um, but I, I do live in Florida now and I need AC to just keep the mold out of my house. Um, my apartment, I should say. Um, but you did, you did a um, funny video recently, um, where you, said you were kind of adapting to the florida heat and then you went inside buildings and yeah. uh you were freezing to death yeah um so that was one thing so the heat was one of the things i was really excited about moving to florida from virginia um is because i have all these uh, methods of adapting to the heat and i was like oh i can finally use this every day but um then i got here and i found out um, how cold most buildings are here. Um, and maybe it doesn't feel cold to most people, but it feels cold to me. And so, um, I have my little, uh, graduate office, which is, um, not much bigger than a cubicle and, um, it gets really cold in there. I, I, uh, usually wear a jacket and a hat. <laughs> How did uh, how did TikTok stock start, Eric? Yeah, so um, I was um, I was seeing this girl in Richmond, and um, I was talking to her about how like it's always um, a girl, yeah, <laughs> um, about how like man, we're in such a real we're in such a weird time right now with like the pandemic and and. Uh, all these disasters in the news and um i just i just feel like i don't know what i can do to um get my voice out there and she was like well get on tiktok start saying stuff there and i was like yeah all right i'll i'll give it a shot which video uh which video call because you don't just get to twenty thousand followers uh yeah, um, I think um, as best I can remember, it was the, um, so I have my series of how to stay cool without AC. I've published um, 13 videos as part of that series so far. So I think it was the third one where I, I talked I about um, three, taking, naps taking naps as a way to beat the heat that really got here, some traction. The and then the second one that really got me some numbers was when I um, showed people how, to, what, like what I do to sleep without AC because the um, whole time I was recording when I was still in Richmond, I, that was when I was living without AC. Um, I had a great roommate who was very patient with me um, and she was cool with the whole thing. Um, and so that, um, that video, I was, um, I was half asleep because it was like 11 at night mm -hmm. and I was just like, Oh, I'll, uh, I'll record this video real quick and I'll see where it goes. And then um, that is uh, by far the video 
um, that got me the most views. And I think a lot of them are hate watches <laughs> of just people being like, what What the hell is this guy yep. doing? <laughs> so, uh, you recently moved to Florida. Mm -hmm. How long are you going to be down there and what are you doing while you're in Florida? Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm getting my PhD um, in medical anthropology. Um, probably going to be down here for the next four years. Um, after that, I'm tentatively mo planning on uh, moving back to Virginia, but we'll see what happens. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a um, there's um, so many opportunities to to study heat here. I'm um, I'm uh, talking with one of my professors who. Um, is working with the city of Tampa on um, on a tree study in the city, and like trees are really important for heat at the city level because um, because the color green reflects heat. So the more trees you have in a city, the less hot that city is going to be overall. So how long will it take you to finish your PhD, Doctor Prepper? Uh, <laughs> about four years and it's funny you say that because i looked up the name dr prepper and there's like four guys who usually who use it already they're not as cool as you man <laughs> so i'll tell everybody the story so uh I, I found eric and reached out i said will you be on the podcast he said absolutely and uh we emailed back and forth a few times and then uh we actually talked last week to kind of tie up some loose ends we didn't talk long and you know, and then uh, he puts out a video where he's coming out of Costco, uh, doing a, a basically a prepper haul, um, stocking back up because his stocks from his previous stockpile build from COVID have gone down some. He's talking about the railway strike. He's talking about hurricane preparedness now that he's in Florida. So I guess the big question everybody wants to know, Eric, is are you a prepper? That yeah, that's a complicated question. I don't. I would say I don't really gravitate toward the the word prepper. Yeah. Um, I knew what your answer I, was going to be. I'm gonna let you finish it. <laughs> um, I, um, but I think with um, studying climate change and natural disasters, it like I think it would be more unusual if I didn't start thinking about that kind of stuff, and. Um, um, funny thing here I have in my notes is that I said that um, we didn't have AC in my house until I was 14. That was also the year that I picked up the zombie survival guide. And um, and I'm reading this book and it's like, you know, besides the stuff about zombies, a lot Everything of else stuff makes just sense. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that was that was my first major exposure to prepping. And, gotcha. Um, so it's always, it's always kind of been back there. So when you're, when you're done with your PhD, I mean, what mm -hmm. is, what is Eric's dream, dream job? What do you want to accomplish? What do you, what do you want your life's mission to be as far as your career goes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would really like to be a science writer and um, just um, write about this stuff all the time. And um as well as um, embark on more research and um, go around the world and see how and just continue the mission to see how folks deal with heat because most of my research um, most of my field research has been in India at this point um, but I would love to go to Australia or Thailand or Brazil and and just see what they're doing nice well let's get into the meat and taters uh, as we say here in the 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 south um i'm gonna let you have it and i'm gonna let you teach everybody um we we talked about trying to give folks some scenarios so we're talking about you know long-term short-term grid down regular old power failures during the heat of summer uh long-term failures all the big prepper stuff we talk about but uh, mm -hmm. with everything that's going on with uh rolling blackouts and with uh there's just so much going on as it relates to power. Um, 
rising energy cost, which are fixing to surprise a whole lot of folks, I think. And uh, uh, But how do we stay cool in disasters uh, inside of our homes, outside of our homes? Those are the questions I always get, and sometimes I don't have the answers. So I'm, well, y'all welcome to the Eric Show. <laughs> um, yeah, so I believe you asked me to come up with a top 10 of tips, and um, – I'll just give them here in no particular order. Um, number one is stay hydrated. Um, that's going to affect your body's ability to process heat. And um, as you get more and more dehydrated, you're going to have um, your going your risk for um, problems is going to increase. Um, number two is stay out of the sun. Um, obviously, if you can, obviously you have you might have stuff to do like in if you're in the aftermath of a hurricane let's say um you're going to be helping your neighbors you're going to be cutting up trees um things like that um if you will be in the sun um cover your head because that solar radiation on um your head is going to heat you up pretty quickly um one thing about the body is that your extremities are the most vulnerable parts of your body for heat. So your head, your neck, your wrists, your hands, your ankles, and your feet are um, some of the spots you really want to be aware of. Um, so covering your head is the most important out of those. If you will, again, if you will be out in the sun, avoid getting sunburned because um, that's going to affect your skin and um, diminish your ability to deal with the heat. Um, number five, use a fan or take advantage of the breeze. Um, this is, this is what, um, folks have been doing since the beginning, um, building houses in order to, um, capture natural breezes to, to cool themselves down. Um, number six, uh, use wet bandanas or wet clothing because that's going to provide evaporative cooling. So if you um, take a t-shirt, soak it in water, put that on, the water's going to evaporate with the heat. And, excuse me, that's going to take away um, the heat from inside your body, and that's going to cool you down, much like sweat does already. So, um, yeah, just accelerating the natural process of sweat. Um, number seven, sleep during the day if you can. Um, number eight, eat fresh fruit, especially watermelon. Um, because if you're eating fresh fruit, you're, um, taking water into your body in a different way. And you're also getting vitamins and you're also getting a pleasant taste. And a lot of people I have found will, um, dismiss that kind of thing of like, okay, well, how does something taste, tasting good help you with a physical problem like heat? and my response to that is it doesn't not help you um, because if it's something pleasant in this very um, difficult situation of dealing with the heat and not having AC, that's going to help you mentally. Um, so number nine, avoid uh, meat and greasy foods because those are going to be harder for your body to digest. Your body is going to end up directing energy toward your stomach to digest those things and um, taking energy away from your skin, your heart, and your lungs um, to help you deal with the heat. And finally, number 10, this is, um, this is actually more community focused than individually focused. Check on your neighbors, um, especially um, sick folks, disabled folks, elderly folks, um, because social isolation is a big way that folks like that die in the heat. Um, Eric Kleinenberg is a researcher that I really respect, and he has um, based a huge chunk of his career off of studying the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And he actually found that social isolation was a bigger um, factor in which people died than not having AC. Um, because some people who had AC, like the, um, 
the power just wasn't there or um, the heat was just too much and um, and it stopped helping after a while. But um, the people who had no AC but did have social connections were able to call on those social connections and move to a different place. Gotcha. Um, so I'm going to simplify it even further. So there's, so you've got the six, the, um, sorry, you've got those 10 things to keep in mind, but there's really just six principles that you, um, kind of have to keep in mind behind those. So the six things that you really need, um, in order to boost your body's ability to fight the heat itself, um, you need food, water, and sleep. So those are the most essential resources for your body to deal with the heat. And the other three things are the external things. You need shade or at least lack of direct sun. You need water and you need a breeze or moving air. I know you did some, just looking at your videos, like things you can do as far as, you talked about the extremities being very helpful. Mm -hmm. and pouring water if you had a limited amount of water where would you pour that water at on your body um yeah so assuming um so assuming i have enough water to drink but maybe i have some gray water um to work with um i would either um you could dip your feet in it you could um use it to soak your um, your shirt or some bandanas and tie those around your wrists. Um, you could dunk your hands in it as, um, ex um, instead of your feet, and um, that would also cool you down. You could pour it on your head. Um, if you, yeah, so, um, so there's a range of options for, for stuff you can do. We've, with water. we've talked a lot on, on my account, um, about recognizing, uh, recognizing heat emergencies as far as mm -hmm. your, your health goes. So, you know, heat cramps and, uh, heat exhaustion and heat stroke and how one leads to the other. And the last one eventually leads to death if not corrected. So, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you have to say on recognizing that you've overdone it? Um, because a lot of people um, try to push through it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a lot of people will take a short break and then go right back out in it, which is also the wrong thing to do. And I'm sure in your travels, you have seen people overcome by heat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the big thing is just pay attention to your body because you're, um, if you're devoting that, attention to yourself you're probably going to notice when something feels wrong and so signs of heat stroke are when you're you're getting really red in the face more than you would be otherwise um if you stop sweating that's a bad, bad sign bad. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um if you if you feel dizzy or disoriented um and um yeah so you want to Get inside, ideally, find a, a cool place in the house. Um, if you can't get inside, get into the shade of a tree or a building. Um, and um, you want to you want to drink water. You want to um, get your electrolytes up um, with something like Gatorade or something like that. And um, and really rest and. Um, make sure you're make sure you're feeling well enough make sure you know you're feeling well enough um, before you try to get back out there i really want to encourage people to go over and check out your your tiktok account and i've linked that several times during the podcast mm -hmm. because uh um sitting here talking about it is one thing but i mean you you show people how to you know where you live and how you're trying to keep it cool and how you sleep at night and, and those types of things. You want to touch on some things you do as far as inside your, your home that, mm -hmm. that keep you cool and help you sleep at night since sleep yeah. is so important for, for you. Yeah, heat. absolutely. So, um, basically going over the video I made back in Richmond, um, you want to have, uh, fans going. If you can, um, 
have windows open, um, definitely do that. Of course, um, some people live in areas where it's not safe or um, you, uh, you might have um, a lot of bugs in your area, in which case you would need screens in the windows. Um, but I love open windows just in principle. Um, so open windows plus uh, fans. Some people put ice in front of their fans and um, I actually did test that technique and it, it really does work. So if you have a working ice maker, um, just get a big bowl of ice, put it in front of your box fan and have that aimed at you as you're sleeping and that will um, that'll really cool you down. Um, also, um, I, uh, I tie uh, wet bandanas around my feet. Um, you can tie them around your hands, but um, like I tend to flop around when I sleep, so that just that just gets my sheets all wet, and it's um, something I'd rather not deal with. And a lot uh, of, a lot of folks may think, you know, this is uh, this is strange, but this is your passion, this is your study. You want to know everything about it, and you don't want to just know about it. You want to live it and experience it. But yeah. I want my audience to understand and put yourself in a disaster scenario where everything is pretty much measurable, either short-term or long-term. We may or may not have power. And and when I have power, I have about 15 fans going in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. I like the noise. I like the airflow. So as far as, as what we do here with my family is we have a solar generator that will power some fans for a little while. Uh, because I realize uh, I've worked as a paramedic most of my life and mm -hmm. dealt with sleep interruption and all that stuff, how important sleep actually is. So uh, when we talk about these very simple things you can do to stay cool inside your home, stay cool outside, I want people to really think about our modern luxuries not existing, ice not being there, electricity not being there, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, this was really a uh, this was really something that hit home for me when I was doing research in India because um, there's definitely people who have AC um, in India and I was I was in uh, Jodhpur in the northwest of India where it's a desert area and um, so if you're working a white collar job in an office they're they're going to have the AC blasting and they're probably going to have it colder than it would be in an American office. Um, but for, for most other people, um, if you're middle-class, let's say, um, you're probably just going to have a swamp cooler and a few electric fans and it really, um, it really connected for me that, um, folks in Jodhpur are a lot more attuned to their environment than we are and it's um i think it's a kind of um humility of of realizing that the outside world is always going to be more powerful than you are and i think for us as americans we we don't do humility all that well because we're uh um, we're a nation of doers and explorers and um we um we're used to bending nature to our will um but i think for the for, for the purposes of prepping um especially prepping for heat um it's it's productive to take on that mindset of um i'm just i'm just gonna accept things for what they are and i'm i'm not gonna be able to control the heat right now so i um i'm gonna um do the things um, that will help me within the circumstances that are going on. Right I'm so now. glad you said that because I have a lot of people. It's a, it's a, it's a stubbornness. I think you, you mm -hmm. say we have trouble with humility because when a lot of people ask me about how do I stay cool if I don't have AC, the answer they want me to give them is to tell them how to build their own air conditioner. Um, instead of learning to adapt and do the simple, sometimes primitive things it requires to stay cooler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, 
I really look at history because air conditioning was only invented in 1902. Um, so we have hundreds and hundreds of years before that of, um, of people living without AC and humans are a really intelligent species and we're going to come up with stuff to do in our environments. Like the ancient Persians pretty much figured everything out 3000 years ago. And um, they knew how to structure their buildings to um, they knew um, to have porches and um, awnings to keep the sunlight out of the windows. And um, they came up with ways to have a, so they would build uh, wind catchers. They would build these um, tower kind of things that were hollow and had a vent at the top to capture the wind, funnel it down to the basement of the building. And in the basement would be a a pool of water and so the water would get cool and moist and then it would circulate throughout the house and they're like again three thousand years ago like no electricity involved so what are the uh tell us some of the coolest stories from your travels um yeah so um one of the one of the coolest things i found in uh india was um they have these um, pots called matkas. They're made of um, unfired clay, and I'm pretty sure they mix the, the clay with cow dung to, to give it a certain consistency. But these things um, cool themselves just with evaporative cooling. And it's, it's not like a refrigerator, it's not that cold, but it is definitely colder than water would be otherwise. And so there's this really amazing um tradition of water giving and it um and i talked a lot about this in my thesis about how this connects to um the the religions of the area um hinduism islam and jainism um but also you can view it in the secular sense of like this just makes sense for people to have water so if you have, um, so people will put these matkas um, with water out in front of their houses or their shops or temples or whatever, and anyone can take from them. And um, because of the cooling effect of the clay, the water is cool. And I wasn't going to drink from these because I'm, I'm a foreigner. Um, I don't know whether the water is filtered, but what I would do is I would pour it on my forearms. And that really makes a difference when you're walking around in the heat. Awesome. And how soon do you think it'll be before you travel again? Um, I'm not sure. I'm um, kind of talking with my um, with my advisor about making a trip this summer. Um, that may be um, just around Florida, but um, but. Um, yeah, I, I definitely do hope to go back to India for my dissertation. Blackbeard Firestarter packs small so you can take it on your plunders. The best kindling for any situation, wet or dry. One rope can light more than 50 fires. Click the link if you dare and get the best fire starter around. I want to get into the topic of the effect that air conditioning has on the environment, uh, mm -hmm. the rising cost of energy, um, and uh, climate change. Because I think, uh, specifically with climate change, a lot of times folks don't want to listen to an opinion about it because so so often it's tied in with politics and polarization mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, and you, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. So. Uh, you you've studied it you're a professional you're an academic i want to know i want to know about all those things mm -hmm. um yeah so with climate change it's um it it kind of is difficult to express it without getting into politics because i think it's tied into a lot of things that also influence politics like um your your um your sense of individuality of like 
is it right for people to sacrifice for the collective good um also your your perceptions of the world of like is the world fragile and in need of protection or is the world um durable and it's just going to keep going and we can we can um keep emitting stuff and um keep going with that based on the models that um folks are putting out now um the ipcc it is the um the biggest authority on climate change um that's the intergovernmental panel on climate change out of switzerland um they um yeah they're they're projecting i don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now but um yeah they're projecting that the whole world is um going to get hotter it's not going to get hotter evenly um there are places like the american southwest that are definitely more at risk than say the great lakes region um but um everywhere is um so most everywhere is going to see hotter summers and those places that aren't going to see hotter summers are going to see warmer winters how does that how does that climate change affect natural disasters is weather related natural disasters obviously it's going to have an effect on it are they going to get yeah. worse are they going to move areas or so um there are some cases where the um the natural disasters will will it's difficult to talk about all natural disasters in the same category, but um, because of that warming effect, some natural disasters like snowstorms are going to become less frequent. Like, um, like Canada, for example, is probably going to see um, less snowstorms um, overall going forward. Now that doesn't mean no snowstorms and they're like, there may be, um, instances where you have fewer snowstorms but the ones that you do have are more intense um but that's that's more in the realm of meteorology yeah. um yeah so uh the rule of thumb for climate change is that whatever trends you're seeing in your area right now those are going to intensify so um again looking at the american southwest it's probably going to get hotter and drier um if you look at a place like the Northeast, it's probably going to get rainier. Um, and so it's, um, it's not just a question of global warming of, of everything getting warmer, but of what, um, these, these changes, um, do to weather patterns overall. And, and also what those changes do to crops and the food supply yeah, and those yeah, types exactly. of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, air conditioning and, and, and what it does and, and energy costs, what do you have to say about that? Um, yeah, so, um, so even if you're, um, even if you're not focused on climate change, even if you, um, um, just trying to stay cool. Yeah. Even if you're just trying to stay cool, um, purely for yourself and your family, yeah. um, you can adopt some of these techniques to, to cut down your energy bills from AC. Um, there are things you can do like, um, putting, so I don't, I, I don't know if this would be feasible in the U S but in Pakistan, they, um, in Pakistan and India, they, um, they will create these awnings of the green um, cloth that you can get at uh, nursery centers. So it's it's um, kind of like a tarp, but it um, but the material is a little different. Um, so I don't know if people would be able to find that stuff. Um, but on the other hand, like. Um, it doesn't take much to block the worst of the sun. So even if you have a thin cloth, you could, um, 
you could probably do something like that of um, just um, if you could rig a, a frame out of wood or something and then put that in front of uh, one of your windows and and you could block the worst of the sun from entering and then your AC is not going to work as hard to um, to keep your house cool. And a lot of times it's the simple stuff. It's keeping yeah. the door shut. It's mm -hmm. being sure that stuff's caulked and insulated properly and mm -hmm. when you improve those things you're not only improving your energy consumption and use you're also actually helping the bigger picture yeah by conserving absolutely energy. also um putting aluminum foil on your windows because i i know that uh there's some folks out there who are saying that to themselves right now <laughs> I've seen a few of those videos on TikTok <laughs> recently, so I know we uh, we uh, keeping an RV uh, cool while you're camping. And that's one of the yeah. tricks is getting that reflex that stuff for the windows. So all sorts of tips and tricks and energy costs. I don't think it's the, the big jumps have really hit us yet. So I think people are going to yeah. be surprised. And actually, if, if if they haven't been concerned about keeping their, if they haven't been worried about their electric bill, they're fixing to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I really like to do is, um, is so we like, we can accept that a lot of a lot of people find AC as a necessary thing, but if you can, um, have as little AC as possible, if you can keep it on, um, 78 or 80, um, that's going to one help with your electric bills and two, it's going to, um, help you develop more resistance to the heat um, because the more heat you can expose yourself to um, the more resistant you will be to it and that's that's one thing I get in my comment sections a lot of just like well how can you do this well it's um, I I don't find it that hard to live without AC because I've practiced living with practice AC. practice yeah. absolutely yeah. And, and those of us that are outside a lot and work outside, you kind of know where your body's limits are and you'd learn mm -hmm. to put up with, with more than you could before. But if you are, you got your house set on 65 and you never go outside and the power goes out and it's, you, you're going to have to adjust not only to the, the heat, but you're going to have to adjust to the rest of the disaster as well. And yep. so um, this is one of the books that I um, have to read for class right now. And I was looking through it last night, and this is one of those very rare academic books that's actually fun to read. And, um, and so the, um, the author, Anna Tsing, um, talks about how um, we might need to get used to the idea that... Um, climate stability is in the past and um, precarity and uncertainty is is our new normal and so um i think that's that yeah that really um hit home for me and i think it's um i know that i know that's really scary for a lot of folks um especially if you're you're already struggling if you're already struggling with stuff like bills. Um, but I think it might be good to kind of meditate on that of, of like, what's the name of the book, Eric? Uh, yeah, it's the, um, the mushroom at the end of the world. Um, by Sounds like my kind of title. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's really cool because, um, she's, um, she's looking at this one type of mushroom, the Matsutake, that's uh, really valued in Japan, um, but it doesn't grow there anymore because of the, um, the changes they've had in their forests. So there's, um, so there's people all over the world who collect these mushrooms and send them to Japan. And the mushroom mainly grows in places where forests have been cut down and then regrown. So, um, so she's looking at um, what does it look like for people who are going into these places where there has been a um, basically an environmental disaster of the 
uh, of a forest being wiped out and then um uh, but then the forest regrows and the mushrooms grow there and so there's, there's just a lot of really cool um meditations on what that um what that means for humanity and um what our future might look like if um if climate change gets as bad as some people are predicting so you know trying to bring everybody together it's like if you even you can you can look at the science you can look at conspiracy theories or you can just look out your window and mm -hmm. see that part of what is happening not just here but globally a lot of it has to do with climate mm -hmm. and and uh, I, I think you're absolutely correct um, that being able to manage it or kind of mediate it is probably not there anymore now there's another book you've done a video on where you were just you were happy as all get out to be telling everybody on TikTok about it uh, like the Queen of in England flying a plane or something oh yeah so that was um that was Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson. And uh, the Queen of the Netherlands is uh, one of the major characters in there. But that was, um, that was a really interesting speculative look um, like 20 years in the future of what our world might look like if, um, if climate change keeps going. Um, it's... Um, It's it's not a very dark book. It's it's um, it's not like a doomsday book or anything like that. Um, but it's it's talking about what the world might be like in the early 2040s, and it um, it focuses on this billionaire in Texas who takes it upon himself to build a sulfur dioxide cannon to shoot shells of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere to try to cool things down and uh, i don't want to spoil too much but there's um but that addition of that chemical into the atmosphere starts affecting weather patterns and there's um certain nations in the world who are like hold up uh you like we need these certain weather patterns to feed our people you can't do this. We're going to take you out. Two of, my, two of my favorite books, and I talk about them on my account all the time, and really they're books that change the way you think and kind of expand your mind, probably like the mm -hmm. books you're mentioning. Uh, the, the first one is the first book in the Going Home series by A American, and okay. they, they take it to the – it's it's an EMP, so it's like worst of the worst. Uh, and then the other book is One Second After, which has a whole lot of medical stuff kind of built. Mm -hmm. a diabetic not able to have refrigerating insulin and stuff but i think books like that even though sometimes they're a little far-fetched really open up your mind whether that be on climate climate or disaster preparedness and just what the possibilities are because if you can't think forward you can't you can't fix the problems we're going to run into yeah yeah so like um just one more book, if you don't mind. So um, yeah. the the absolute um, best book recommendation I have in terms of um, what the future may look like is Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Um, and if you go on my TikTok, I think it's the very first video I have all the way down at the bottom. Um, I wasn't I wasn't really paying attention to the camera or anything. Um, way back then, but um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's just incredible. Of and it, like the thing is, it was written all the way back in 1993 because um, the author was looking at possible trends of things going on all the way back then, and she wrote this vision of the future. And to me, at least, it just it. Um, Yeah, it, it, there's a whole lot of preparedness books that were written a long time ago too, and they kind of yeah. like, whoa, they 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 saw this coming 20 years ago. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. My uncles are actually really into those. Nice. <laughs>
So we uh we try to keep it light on our account and mm -hmm. uh and have fun and goof. So uh yeah, so I've noticed a few of your videos are you seem to see, have a little bit of a sense of humor. Am I am I reading that wrong or am I right? Yeah, I, I mean I I try to. Like I think um I um I think it's one of those key elements that um helps people absorb the message because like i think i could be um very dour about this kind of stuff and i could be like oh like you better adopt these tips or like bad things are gonna happen but uh i no, think, hum I, I I think to... humor makes you a good teacher <laughs> i think yeah. humor makes you a good teacher it's a way to connect with people yeah so uh, i'm definitely at some point doing this podcast probably right now throwing up a side by side of me and you both doing shirtless videos <laughs> so uh all right oh man thank you for being here you gotta what's your yeah. final what's your final message to to uh and i'll say this as well to to the folks that uh follow you that have watched the podcast i'm, I'm glad you guys made it over and uh this probably won't be the last time me and eric talk so uh um uh, kindred souls so what, yeah. do, what do you have to what do you have to say to my followers and your followers everything's hard for everyone right now and um that's um if things are particularly hard in your life just cut yourself a break uh, don't try to do everything perfectly um just grab those little handholds where you can and um and we don't really know what the future's gonna hold but there are ways we can help ourselves and help each other and i think that's the way we make the future than it would that's the way we make the future better than it otherwise would be that's perfect that that is uh that's a good message my friend because there is a lot going on and uh we're all in it no matter what side we're on what you believe what you don't believe and it's mm -hmm. uh working together and and keeping an open mind and trying to learn and talking with people across the aisle and just doing the best you can um, and trying to learn how to prepare if some of the creature comforts go away money electricity those types of things so mm -hmm. uh, but but staying cool is is managing heat emergencies is part of disaster preparedness and uh like like eric said uh acclimating yourself now whether that means turning your thermostat up a few degrees or taking a weekend camping trip when it's super hot and humid. Um, if you can experience these things, you can evaluate what your weaknesses are and find out where you need to improve. And the only reason Eric is so good at having his thermostat so high is he's practiced it. So any of those survival skills that, that you don't have, you just have to practice them. So... Man, I enjoyed it, dude. That, that so was, did I. This is I'm great. gonna have you. I'm gonna have you back at some point. So yeah, I can't I think wait. There's a. I think there's a whole lot we can talk about. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, if you guys, uh, uh, I, I'll throw it up here one more time. Be sure you follow Eric on TikTok uh, at uh, Eric underscore. Uh, under, I can't talk. Eric underscore the underscore green. Uh, give him a follow. There's some comedy over there. There's some chest hair. There's a, uh, there's a lot of water, a lot of sweat, and uh, uh, it's good stuff. And man, I'm glad if TikTok is, you know, as crazy as TikTok is with the, uh, the hate, the division, and the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, finding finding good people is fun, and yeah. having a relationship with people with we wouldn't have otherwise ever met. So yeah. I'm glad I met you, brother, and. Uh, well, uh, we're going to get out of here. Eric, you want to say bye? Uh, yeah. Bye, everyone. Um, thanks for listening. All right, guys. We will see you on the next The Safe Prep Show. I'd like to thank Eric for joining us this evening. Y'all take you, care. Jason. Take really care of each it. other. Thank you, brother. All right. Take care.